Hi there, and welcome to the webinar, Estate Planning Basics. I'm so happy to see you here and so happy to see that you're interested in learning about how estate planning can benefit you and your loved ones. I'm Laura Bromlow with Bromlow Law. I'm an estate planning attorney, and I'm also a certified elder law attorney through the National Elder Law Foundation. I've been practicing in this practice area since 2012, and I've been licensed to practice law since 1997. I'm currently actively licensed in both California and Texas, and so I can help people with estate planning in both states. Now, my real passion is holding families and their small businesses together, which is why I do estate planning. I hold families and their small businesses together by teaching them to communicate it's a huge part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Part of that communication involves putting an estate plan in place so that loved ones know what your wishes are if you become incapacitated or die. And so that plan goes a long way to preventing conflicts from arising among your loved ones. And I just love what I do um, with clients every day. I love seeing their passion for holding their own families together. And I love coming alongside clients and helping them with that. We're going to be talking about um, the basics of estate planning. And I want to start with what is an estate plan? And so what I have defined estate planning it as is a life-affirming, loving gift for you and your loved ones. It's life affirming because you're starting here from a healthy, whole place where you can think about what's important in your life. You can think about who's important in your life. And from that place, you can make that the impetus of why you're even doing the estate plan. And then you're creating your estate plan with those things in mind, and your estate plan is going to reflect those values. So it is life affirming. It is a chance to really reflect on, oh my gosh, this gift that we call life and what you get to do because of this life and who you get to love because of this life. So it's life affirming. It is a loving gift for yourself because you get to say now, while you are healthy and whole, what you would want to happen, how you would want to be treated, and how you want things handled if you become incapacitated. It's a loving gift for your loved ones because you are putting a plan in place that will allow them to simply follow your plan, not argue with each other. So now they get the support of each other. They get to come alongside each other while they're going through this difficult thing of your incapacity or your death and support each other and just follow your plan rather than arguing over what it is that you would have wanted. So what we're gonna be talking about when we talk about estate planning is taking care of your family, your comfort, and your business. So let's talk about your business a little bit. We are also going to do all of those things for your business. So we're going to be talking about how you want your business handled, who you want handling it, if you're still alive but incapacitated, and what happens to that business when you pass away. So you're going to have total assurance of all these things once you've gone through a thorough estate planning process uh, with an attorney who practices in a customized manner. Now, several people have ideas of why they're not doing their plan. And here's three of the most um, often heard misconceptions. Number one, I don't have an estate. So how can I do an estate plan? So a lot of people hear the term estate plan and out of that pops that word estate and they think that they have to have a very large amount of assets. They have to own a lot. They have to be, um, you know, worth a lot of money. And that's just not true. As I've already said, a big part of estate planning is simply planning for who's going to do what when you can no longer do it yourself. And so if you are an adult and you're breathing, you need an estate plan. 
Um, my spouse gets it all when I die anyway. This is a huge misconception. A lot of people think that their spouse is going to get everything or be in charge of everything if they can't be in charge of it. This is just not true. So if you become incapacitated, just because you're married and you have a marriage license does not mean that your spouse is going to be able to take over uh, the management of things for you. It also does not mean that they're going to get everything of yours when you pass away. Take, for example, um, an unknown to you client of mine, a couple who came in to see me. They're on their second married marriage, both of them. They each have children from previous marriages. They don't have children together. They just have the children from previous marriages. And when husband passes, Wife is now going to own their home that they owned jointly together with husband's children. And so her wife is not going to be able to sell that house without the consent of husband's children. She's not going to even be able to get a mortgage on it to help pay for her um, long-term care if she needs it without the consent of those children. And so that's just one example of how this is a misconception. Now, a lot of people say, I can't afford it. Okay, estate planning can be expensive depending on what attorney you use or how you do it. But what I would pose to those people who say, I can't afford it is, can you afford to not do it? If you don't do it now and you become incapacitated, you're gonna see that that could cost you a lot of money or at least cost your family a lot of money. Um, you're also gonna see that you're either gonna pay for estate planning now or your family and loved ones are gonna pay for probate or they're gonna pay, um, pay to clean up the mess that's left behind because you didn't do the estate plan ahead of time. So one way or another, somebody's gonna be paying. And it, in my opinion, I think you would rather have a say yourself about how things go than leave it up to the court. So those are the main misconceptions that I hear about why people don't plan. Now, there's lots of reasons to plan. I'm going to point out a few. One is, you know, at incapacity, you get to say what you want. And we've kind of already talked about that. Who's going to manage what for you, What, how you want to be treated, how you want your money managed. But in addition to saying what you want, you also get to say what you don't want and who you don't want. And so sometimes this is just as important, if not more important to people than, um, you know, saying what they do want. Same thing at death. Um uh, if at death, you want to say who gets what, how they get it, and when they get it, then you need an estate plan. If you want to say who doesn't get something, then you need an estate plan. Another reason to plan is family relationships. So family relationships we've already talked about, but we wanna leave things as smooth as possible and have as easy of a transition for our loved ones as we can. Now, some other reasons to plan might be asset protection. If you're in a high risk um, profession, you may need, may need to think about asset protection. You may be a charitable person and you may want to do some planning around your charities and making sure that they, they get something. Um, Taxes could be an issue for some people and loss prevention. So you want to make sure that you don't lose anything to the state or that nothing gets left behind. So now if you don't have an estate plan, which is common, I think 60% of people in the United States don't have any sort of estate plan. So you're not alone if you don't. But if you don't, guess what? The state of Texas or the state of California or whatever state you're in has a plan for you. And it may not be exactly what you want. So let's talk about incapacity first. If you become incapacitated, the state's plan for you is what we call a guardianship. In California, this might be called a conservatorship. So depending on where you are, the state's plan is gonna be a conservatorship or guardianship. It's basically the same thing. 
There's a guardianship of the estate or conservatorship of the estate. And there's a guardianship or conservatorship of the person. So let's talk about of the person first. This is a person who would be appointed by the court. If you can't make your own decisions, the person has to go to court to prove that you, you're incapacitated. So first of all, they're dragging your um, mental abilities to court, a public forum, to prove that you're no longer have capacity to manage your own things or make your own decisions. And they're saying to the court, strip this person of their rights and give them to me so that I can make the decisions for this person. Guardianship of the person is going to make decisions such as where you live, your medical decisions, and personal decision making. Now, a guardianship of the person isn't that expensive. It is not fun to do because you have to go to court and you do have to report to the court once a year. Um, but there's not a lot of reporting that needs to be done, just a small report that's submitted to the court once a year. And so it's not a huge deal, but if you have any assets that need to be managed by somebody else, then your loved one is getting a guardianship or conservatorship of the estate so that they can pay your bills, so that they can manage your money. Maybe you have real estate that they need to manage. Maybe you've got retirement assets or life insurance policies, and they need to manage the investment of the retirement assets, or they need to manage the beneficiary designations on those because you know, for whatever reason, somebody that you previously designated as a beneficiary died or you didn't ever name one. So there's many reasons they might need a guardianship of the estate. Now, the problem with the guardianship of the estate is not only is it public, you have to go to court and that's a pain, but also it's expensive. You have to pay somebody to create an accounting for the guardianship of the estate. And every year you have to report to the court uh, what the money's been used for, and the court is overseeing this. And so it's going to cost at least $10,000 a year for a guardianship of the estate. Not only that, but who do you think the, gar the court is going to appoint as the guardian over you and your estate? If you haven't don't have a plan and you haven't said who it should be, the court makes that decision. And so we've seen situations where um, siblings are fighting. So uh, the picture is a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you didn't get that. But anyway, so we've seen examples of siblings fighting with each other um, over who should be the guardian of mom or dad. And the court doesn't know either of these kids from Adam. So there could be a bad sibling and there could be a good sibling. Okay, maybe you don't like the term bad and good. Maybe one's just less responsible than the other. But on paper, they don't look that different. And maybe the bad kid comes to court looking really nice. He's wearing a nice suit or whatever. The court could possibly pick the wrong child to be your guardian. Not only that, but the court might say, hey, you two kids are fighting and I don't really know you other than, you know, what you're telling me in court. And I know you're presenting your best face, so I can't make a decision between the two of you. So I'm going to appoint an independent um, guardian, an independent third party, not a family or a friend, but a stranger to this family to act as the guardian of your estate and your person. So I've seen this happen several times. And then if you are a person with minor children, not only does somebody have to get a guardianship over you, but what happens to your minor child or children? Well, they also need a guardianship. And if you don't have a plan, who do you think is going to be raising your children if you become incapacitated? Mm, will it be the evil stepmother? Mm. Or could it be your mentally unstable sister who wants access to your money? Or could it be your sister who seems to have it all together? She's got a great resume on paper. She looks really good on paper, but she just doesn't share your same values. And so she'd be raising your kid in a different valued home. Well, the court's gonna make the decision and the court has a lot of cases to get through. 
they don't know any of your family members. So they're going to be looking at the resume of the loved one who is coming forth. So that is another reason you should probably have a plan. Now, the state has a plan. That's what we've just talked about. That's the state's plan for incapacity. What we just talked about was guardianship or conservatorship. What we're going to talk about now is what is the state's plan if you die? You don't have a plan in place. What's the state's plan? Well, it involves going to court. Okay. So let me just say here, if you have a will-based plan, you're like, oh, you know what? Don't worry. I've got a will. So at least, you know, I don't have to go by the, the state's plan. Well, that's true. You get to say who you want to get your stuff through the will, but it's still going to require going to court with a will-based plan. And so either with a will or without a will, we're going to go through some sort of probate process. What happens, we've already talked about incapacity, but when you die, the very first um, thing that, well, one thing that happens is when you die, if you have certain assets that have beneficiary designations and the beneficiaries are still alive, ah, now you can avoid court with those assets. So if you've got an IRA, a 401k or life insurance policies and you've named your kids as the beneficiaries, no problem. At first glance, you don't have to go to court. Ah, but if those children are minors, can minor children receive money? No, they cannot. And so what's going to happen is somebody's going to have to go to court to get that guardianship of the estate over the minor's assets that he or she is going to be inheriting so that they can even inherit that money, even if it's beneficiary designated. Now, the other issue with these kinds of assets is that they go to the beneficiaries outright. So let's say you've got a 21-year-old child, but they are not through college. They're sh still showing some uh, irresponsibility. They're not quite good with money yet. Um, you die. You've got a 401k that named them as a beneficiary. It's going to go directly to them. And they might decide to quit college or they might decide to go travel abroad until the money's gone. So you have to know that if you've named the beneficiary in these types of assets, it's going to the beneficiaries directly with no protections. The other thing that happens when you die, if you have a will, um, either with a will or without a will, all your accounts are going to be frozen immediately when, when the financial institution gets wind that you have passed away. Um, so with a will-based plan or with no plan at all, this is what happens. Now, you're going to be going through a probate process with or without a will, and they're very similar. Um, the only difference is that with a will, you've said who gets your, your stuff when you die. Without a will, we follow the state's um, determination of who gets what. So you die. Once you die, somebody goes to court and they're going to file an application either to submit your will to probate or for an airship determination, either one. But either way, there's going to be a public publication put in the newspaper that, hey, so-and-so has passed away. If you are a creditor, come forth now and make a claim against the estate. So the whole purpose of putting um, notice in the newspaper is to let creditors know that if they have a claim against your estate, they should come forth now. So it's really for the benefit of creditors that we do that. It's also public. So I have probate clients all the time that are telling me, Oh my gosh, you know, we after we filed this uh, thing on mom's will or for dad because he didn't have a will, he didn't have a plan, I started getting all these notices in the in the mail. And that's true because it's public. Um, so people will find out about solicitors, you name it, and they will start contacting you. The court will enter an order that so-and-so is appointed as the executor or the personal representative of the estate. And that person's job is to gather all the assets of the deceased, 
sell any real estate, pay off creditors, and then finally to make distributions. So that is how the probate process basically goes. And what you also need to know about the probate or airship process is that if you have anything out of state, so if you're in Texas and you have property in California or Florida, you're also going to have to open up a probate in California and Florida. Um, vice versa, if you're in California and you have property in Texas and Florida, you have to open a probate in every state that you have assets in. So finally, we want to say, and I've kind of already mentioned this, that all assets to your children go to them outright. So are they ready for that responsibility is another question. Now, the state's plan also decide if you don't have a plan, this is without a will now, the state decides who gets what of your property. And as I've already said, if you're in that blended family situation, his and her kids, and one of the spouses dies, the surviving spouse shares that homestead with the children in terms of ability to sell or the ability to leverage that stuff. And so Things don't always go past to heirs the way you think they will under state law. The other concern without having a plan, the state's plan for the kids is again, to require a guardianship of the estate for that minor child who is inheriting under your um, estate if you die. And then the last thing that I'm gonna talk about, not last thing, second to last thing, is lost assets. So if you don't have a plan and you haven't gotten yourself organized financially so that your loved ones find things in an organized fashion, you have the potential of losing some assets to the state, to the state's unclaimed property division. For example, in Texas, there's approximately $5 billion in unclaimed property. And so you see that loss is a big problem for many families and you don't wanna be one of them. And so it's best to get an estate plan, which will require you, that process will require you to get organized financially. And then finally, what about the family? Um, you know, again, without a plan, we're letting them fight, um, get upset about who gets what, and you also have not protected them. The state doesn't protect uh, your family members or loved ones. If you have someone that is an individual with special needs that inherits from your estate, there's no protections around that. And so they have the ability, they have the potential to lose their SSI, a needs-based benefit, or their Medicaid, which is also a needs-based benefit. So um, the other thing is medical expenses or protecting your in uh, your beneficiaries from themselves. Maybe they're, you know, they spend money unwisely, they don't manage money wisely. Or, and you're also not giving them any credit or protection. So the state's plan does not include any of these types of protection, which you may have wanted to implement if you had done a plan. And so we're gonna talk about, instead of heading to court so often because you don't have a plan, let's talk about what it would look like to actually have a plan and what would it involve? So I'm gonna talk to you first about what are the must have documents in case of incapacity or death? You wanna make sure that you have, if these certain documents in place in case you become incapacitated, a financial power of attorney saying who is gonna manage your assets, a medical power of attorney saying who, and it might be somebody different, is handling your medical decisions, you may wanna have an advanced directive that says, this is when I would like to be on life-sustaining treatment, or this is when I do not want life-sustaining treatment in these certain circumstances, or any other medical directives that you feel strongly about. We can put those in writing and let the family know and make it a legal document. You'll also always want a HIPAA authorization. 
The HIPAA authorization will allow those loved ones that you list in the document to access your medical records and talk to your doctors. So it's usually going to be that agent that you've named as a medical power of attorney. Um, and so this is an important document to have and make sure your doctors have a copy of it. You'll want to make sure that you have a declaration of guardianship and a declaration for temporary guardianship um, for any minor children that you have. And so that if you become incapacitated, the temporary guardian would be someone who lives close by and they would also be a temporary medical power of attorney for your, your child in case of an emergency in your absence or your incapacity. And this would be somebody who lives close by. It might be a friend. So for example, in my situation, we don't live near family. And so my permanent guardian for our children lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And so we um, have temporary guardians named here, which are family friends who could be with our children within 15 minutes or less and be with them until that permanent guardian that we've named from St. Louis can fly down here and be with the kids. If the kids, if my kids need medical attention before that permanent guardian can get here, that temporary guardian is going to have a medical power of attorney in place so that they can make medical decisions. You know what this does is it makes sure that my kids don't end up in foster care because my permanent guardian that I named isn't here in time. So I don't want my kids in strangers' homes. So I've done a temporary guardianship nomination. And then finally, the last document that you may need is a revocable living trust. Um, and we'll talk more about that, but that is an optional document. For death, you must have a will um, if you want to say who gets what when you die. You'll also want an appointment of disposition of remains and instruction for disposition of remains, saying how you want your body handled uh, when you're gone. And then finally, also a revocable living trust is another optional document. So I've already told you how the will requires you to go to court and go through the probate process, It's which is public, and the other downside to it, especially in California, is the cost. So in California, you're going to be spending tens of thousands of dollars on a probate if you even have just a house. You have just a house in California, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to probate that estate. In Texas, it's not as bad. You will spend between five and $10,000 on a probate, uh, depending on whether you have the will and how the will is, is done, whether it's executed properly or not. Um, so it's not as expensive and it's also much quicker in Texas. And in fact, Texas calls itself a probate friendly state. However, I don't call a public um, forum necessarily friendly. So I'm not sure that you can call anything that has probate friendly, but a lot of clients say, no, I'm fine with going through probate. It doesn't matter to me. And that's totally fine too. We can do will-based plans. But I'm going to turn our attention to a living trust and how that works at incapacity and at death um, in case you want to do that additional document. So a revocable living trust is what we're talking about. It's revocable. You can change it at any time. It's living because it takes effect during your life. Well, we're going to talk about what a trust is. A trust is a three-party contract. The first party to this contract is a trustor. And the trustor can also be called a settlor or a grantor. But the trustor is the person who creates the trust and transfer trust assets to the trust. So that's going to be my client who comes in and talks to me. And we sit there and we design the trust together. That trustor decides what the rules to his or her trust it are. They're going to appoint who the trustee is. And the trustee is the person who manages the trust assets. So the trustee is a fiduciary under the law. And so they have a fiduciary obligation to manage the trust assets for the benefit of the third party, the beneficiaries. The trustor is also the person who gets to name who the beneficiaries are. And the beneficiary is the person who gets the benefit 
of all of the assets that are held in the name of the trust. So we've got the trustor creating it, the trustee managing it, and the beneficiary receiving the benefit of it. And so you will notice that um, if a couple comes into me, let's say Bob and Sue, you'll notice that they have total control because they're going to name themselves in each role. They're going to come into me as the trustors, the client creating the trust. They're going to name themselves as the trustee to manage their assets that are now going to be owned by the trust. And they're going to name themselves as the beneficiary of the trust for as long as they are alive. And so because they're in all three positions to begin with, it's going to be business as usual for them. So they're going to be in total control. They're going to continue to pay bills online if they want. They're going to know that the trust can be amended or revoked at any time because we're talking about a revocable living trust. They can still buy, sell, and refinance their assets the way they always have. They're going to report income taxes the way they always have. No new income taxes as a result of this revocable living trust and no new way to report it. Same old way. There's also not going to be any change in property tax bills. In Texas, they're going to maintain their homestead exemption. And in California, no new tax uh, property tax either. So you may be saying, well, if they're in all three roles, isn't it just like they own it themselves? And so what's so important about this? Well, it's a standby device. This trust that is now bifurcated all the, trifurcated maybe, all of the roles, the, the trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary roles, it's a standby device so that we can avoid court in the event that someone becomes disabled or dies. And it's going to benefit who you want it to benefit. How does it do that? Well, the magic is in how you hold title to your assets. Okay, so for example, you currently hold title in your name. Let's talk about my Aunt Julie who owns this book. This book belongs to Aunt Julie, right? So she's holding the book. Um, I imagine her ownership as her holding the book, right? So she's holding it. Let's say she has a stroke and she becomes incapacitated. She's still holding it because that's the ownership that I'm picturing, right? Um, and so she's still holding it. She's got title to it. And so if she has a stroke and she can't decide who to give the book to or who to allow to manage that book, on her behalf because she can't communicate, she's incapacitated, she can't make decisions, right? Then who has a right to take that book out of her hand and manage it or sell it or do whatever they want to do with it? Nobody. Nobody has a legal right to. And so where do we have to go to get the right? We have to go to court to get the right to take it out of Aunt Julie's hand and manage it for her benefit. That's the guardianship of the estate, and so what if we put title instead of in Aunt Julie's name individually, what if we put title in Aunt Julie's living trust? Now, Aunt Julie's not actually holding it. She's holding a bucket called the living trust. She's holding the bucket called the living trust. And um, the bucket holds the book. And so all we have to do now is look to the bucket and the terms of the bucket or the contract called the trust. Now we look to the trust contract and it says who gets to hold the book if Aunt Julie no longer can. We don't have to go to court to find out who that is. We look to the contract. I hope that made sense. Um, so that's how title works to alleviate the court, the requirement to go to court. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the bucket concept a little bit more. We're going to talk about the revocable living trust as being a bucket. And in that bucket, we are going to put all of your assets, whether it's your home, 
your personal property, which might be your car, your jewelry, your collections. And we're gonna put all your financial accounts in the bucket as well. There are a couple kinds of financial accounts that we're not gonna put in the bucket. And when I say in the bucket, I'm saying it's now gonna be owned by the revocable living trust, no longer by you individually. And your attorney will help you figure out how to do that. The assets that don't go into the bucket are your retirement accounts and your life insurance policies, okay? They're gonna stay outside of the bucket. They're gonna stay in your individual name. But those have beneficiary designations. And because they have beneficiary designations, we're going to name the trust as a beneficiary. So when I die, now my trust is the beneficiary. So now that stuff pours into the bucket of the trust. And now the trust governs them. But it doesn't govern those assets until they're poured into the bucket. And so the other thing that I want to make sure I have here for those retirement and life insurance policies is a power of attorney in, in case of my incapacity, I want my agent to be able to manage those assets. So only for those types of assets do I do a power of attorney and a beneficiary designation into the bucket. Everything else is gonna be owned by the trust. So this is how the trust is gonna work through the different life, the different time periods of life. While both spouses are alive, they're both acting as trustee, they're both acting as beneficiary. Let's say husband becomes incapacitated. Oh, we don't have to go to court because all of their assets are owned by the trust. And so we just have to look to the terms of the trust. We open up the trust document and lo and behold, the trust document says, if husband becomes incapacitated, his wife gets to manage everything. So we can avoid the guardianship. That's how we avoid guardianship of the husband, guardianship of the estate of the husband. Now, when husband dies, wife is still alive. We avoid probate because, oh, look at that. All of the assets are owned by the trust. So we look to the terms of the trust. And the trust says wife continues to act as trustee and husband's share of the property goes either all to wife, some to the kids, however they wanted to do it. But we follow the terms of the trust. Then when um, later on, if wife becomes incapacitated, she's the only one still alive, but she becomes incapacitated. We don't have to go to court for her guardianship because we look to the terms of the contract. Oh, look at that. It says if wife is the only one alive still and she becomes incapacitated, uh, Kate, the daughter, is going to take over as trustee and take over management of the assets that are in the trust. So look at that, we didn't have to go to court um, for a guardianship of the estate of mom either. And then when mom passes away again, we're avoiding probate because we look to the terms of the trust and lo and behold, it says when the second of us dies, um, Kate is going to act as the trustee and she's going to gather all the assets and she's gonna distribute them half to Josh, her brother, and half to herself. And not only that, but we get to say how it goes to Josh and Kate. So they're going to say that it goes to Kate in a lifetime trust so that it protects Kate from her possible divorce down the line. Um, and it protects her from any certain creditors. OK, so we're going to give her some creditor protection and some divorce protection. And for Josh, maybe he's an individual with special needs. So we're going to say his share goes into a special needs trust so that he can maintain his SSI benefits and his Medicaid benefits. Or if Josh is just irresponsible, or maybe he's drug addicted or something like that, we're going to put it in a trust for his benefit, but have somebody else be in charge of it. So we get to say how it passes to the children. So that is how a trust works. I hope that gives you a good explanation. I hope you've seen what documents you need to choose. I want to talk to you a little bit about moving forward with your own estate planning and choosing a lawyer. I just want to point out that doing it yourself on uh, LegalZoom or other um, companies, some there's some that you can find at um, Home, not Home Depot, Office Depot or Office Max or things like that. Um, you're not going to have the benefit of expert guidance and it's going to leave a lot of room for error. 
Also, if you go to an attorney that has something else as their main practice and doesn't practice in estate planning full time, uh, a lot of things can be left through the cracks. So if you do traditional lawyer or do it yourself plan, you do get to say who takes your kids if you pass away. Um, the money will probably go through probate court and your kids will receive their inheritance last after creditors. Um, assets could be missed because doing it yourself and traditional attorneys are not very focused on getting you organized financially. And um, contingency planning may not be considered. So I can talk to you more about that at another time, but uh, leave it to say that in if I do your plan or if someone like my firm does your plan, an attorney who focuses solely on estate planning and that is their, that's all that they do, they're going to be up to date and they're going to be very thorough. They're going to have customized plans for you. And so they're going to have a lot of contingencies built into your plan in case somebody becomes disabled or in case somebody inherits and they're under age and we didn't think they were going to inherit under your trust. Um, so contingencies like that. And so what happens if you work with a traditional attorney who doesn't have this as their main practice area or you do it yourself is that your plan is not going to work when you need it. If you work with us or another attorney who focuses solely on estate planning, what I do is for those people who have minor children, I do something called a children's crisis plan. And so I'm going to have you say, who takes your kids if you pass away, but also who should not take your kids uh, if you pass away or if you become incapacitated. Your money's gonna be available immediately for your children without having to go to court. You're gonna say who's gonna be caring for them on a temporary basis um, while your permanent guardian is getting there. The children's crisis plan also comes with babysitter instructions and instructions to your trustee and to your guardian. It also comes with ID cards that you carry in your wallet for first responders. So if you're in an accident, the first responder is gonna find that ID card, know exactly who to call for your children so that they don't end up in foster care. Um, let's see what else. The other thing that I offer, um, in my firm is a legacy interview. And I'm going to talk to you about that, but it's basically an, a videotaped interview where I can ask you predetermined questions, or you can just tell us your story. And that is a videotape that you will leave to the next generation so that you make sure to leave behind your values. Um, we're, we like to, have a lifelong relationship with our clients. And so if you have any legal issue that comes up, if you're our client, we want you to reach out to us, let us know what your legal situation is, and we will help you find someone. I have a systems in place for my estate planning, so nothing falls through the cracks. I have developed them over the years of practice, over the past 11 years of practice in this area. And I tweak something at least yearly in my systems to make sure that it's working better all the time for my clients. And so nothing's going to be missed. And my plan is going to work for you when you need it. And so you need to find someone who, who does very thorough planning. Now I wanna to talk to you about leaving your real legacy. So your real legacy doesn't have to do with the money that you leave behind. It, it's about the stories and who you were at your essence, who you are as an individual, you're leaving that behind to your loved ones. And so I'm gonna tell you a sweet story about my sweet mother-in-law who lived in Kansas. We were living in California at the time and my children were very young. She was a school teacher and so she loved children's stories and she would read on audio tape. She would read children's stories on tape tape herself reading them, and then send them out to us with the book so that my kids could read along the book with grandma saying it to them. Now, grandma passed away a few years ago, and we found those tapes in the attic. My kids are older now, but we found them, and my husband was overjoyed because now he got to hear his mom's voice again, and what a gift that was just to hear her voice. Imagine how much more meaningful it might be for him to hear her voice saying how important he was to her or talking about some of her life lessons or some of her values. 
Those are really important things to leave behind. So whether you do a legacy interview with us, um, which is a videotape, or if you want to do um, your own, or if you want to do a novel, uh, write your own biography, scrapbooking, whatever it is, you need to find a way to leave your real legacy behind to your loved ones. I wanna tell you a little bit about our process here at Bromlow Law. Um, the very first thing that we'll do is we'll send you a questionnaire. It's a very thorough questionnaire. And what I want you to know about it is if you ask us to do this, the most important part is your personal information, your family information, and information about your assets. And when it comes to the assets part, I don't need um, account numbers. I do not need uh, financial institutions. What I need is what kind of asset is it? Is it a 401k, an IRA? Is it real property? Is it a checking account? Is it a CD? Is it a savings account? What kind of asset is it? And approximately how much is it worth? So I don't need exact amounts, but approximate amounts. This helps me give you some advice around tax planning and that kind of thing. <clears throat> the next step would be a love and legacy consultation. And you will, you and I will meet either by Zoom in my office or with if you're within a half an hour of me, I'll come to you if you prefer. A lot of my elderly clients like that. The love and legacy consultation will take up to two hours. And at that time, we'll go through your questionnaire. I'll make sure that I understand what all your concerns are. I'll really get to know you as a person and understand your values. And then we will jump right into the designing of your plan. And you'll bring your expertise of your family. I'll bring my expertise of the law and my professional experiences. And together, we will form the perfect plan for you. Um, confirmation of important and missing information is the next step. After that initial consultation, about a week later, you'll get a confirmation of important and missing information. And this is a document that you confirm I've spelled everybody's name right, that I've got everybody's address correct and phone numbers, and that the plan reflects what we've talked about and what you want for your family. You'll then get that back to me with any changes or additions that you needed to make. And then about two weeks after you get it back to me, we'll have a draft review. The draft review is gonna be on Zoom. I'm gonna pull up the document on my computer so you can see it on your computer at the same time. And we're gonna go through all the documents to make sure you understand what you'll be signing. If you're in California, about a week later, you'll be signing the documents. If you're in Texas, a couple days later, you'll be signing the documents. And by the way, I help clients in all of Texas and in all of California. If you're not close by, we simply get a, a notary who can come to you to do the signing. Then you'll have the signing. And then after that, we're gonna make sure that you know how to coordinate your assets with your estate plan. This is a vital piece. If you don't coordinate the assets with the trust or with the will, it's not gonna work the way you want it to. So a huge part of this um, process is that coordinating the assets. And I will remind you about that time again, time and again. So I talked to you about it at the first stage, which is the consultation. I talk about it again at, at the draft review. I talk about it again at signing, and then we talk about it again. And um, then I follow up with you. So you, you will know that that's vital. I always offer a family meeting to all of my clients. And this is after signing, you bring your key players to the table so that they can meet me. It doesn't have to take long. It may be 15 minutes to 30 minutes long. We meet each other and I tell them that you've created a plan. This is what their role in the plan is. And, um, at, and you tell them where you're gonna be keeping the plan. Those are the key points of that meeting. Um, next is the legacy interview if you want to have that. And finally, I want to have that lifetime relationship with you. And I recommend that you review your documents every three years, but you reach out to me anytime you've got a question about it. Now at the love and legacy consultation, I've already told you a little bit about it, but before you come in, you're going to be getting very financially organized. That um, questionnaire is going to help you do that. You're at the consultation, you're gonna be making informed and empowered decisions. Um, I'm gonna help you do that. 
Our prices range between $29.95 to $79.95, with most people falling right in the middle around four, five, six thousand. Um, I do all flat fees. And the reason I do all flat fees is because I want to encourage my clients to call me when they've got questions about their estate plan. And so I'm very patient. I'm very uh, generous with my time to my clients, which is why I do flat fees. So email me and call me with questions. Make sure you understand your plan. And make sure your assets are coordinated. Um, you're going to know with certainty after you've had that consultation with me that your family, your loved ones are taken care of and that you've been expertly guided through this process. So for joining us today during this webinar, I want to offer you a gift certificate, a golden ticket, if you will. It's worth $1,100. Um, if you sign up, after this um, webinar today for a love and legacy consultation, we will give you that love and legacy consultation free of charge, and we will give you an additional $300 off, but you need to contact myself or Dina, my client services director, at one of these emails, dina at bromlolaw.com or laura at bromlolaw.com to schedule your LLC, your, your love and legacy consultation today um, to claim your golden ticket. And we want you to use this ticket to benefit yourself and your family and make sure that you have a plan. We wanna thank you so much for attending today. I hope this information was useful and I look forward to meeting you. Please email me with any questions, any follow-up questions. And hopefully um, you'll use that golden ticket to schedule a love and legacy consultation with me. I look forward to it. Have a great day. Um, here's my contact information in case uh, you need to get a hold of me. Thanks so much. Have a good one.